All right, everybody, welcome. Um, we are going to be looking in our textbook, our uh, Yellow We the People book uh, by Ginsburg, Lowy, Weir, Tolbert, and Spitzer, the 11th Essentials Edition, at Chapter 2. Uh, in this lecture, uh, Chapter 2 deals with the founding and the Constitution, and uh, we are actually going to skip over... Uh, chapter one uh, for time's sake because we only have you know a certain uh, amount of weeks together uh, we're gonna skip over that and we're gonna move right forward into the founding and the Constitution <clears throat> one thing to note is I have been suffering from a summer cold um, and so I'm battling sinus issues and um, uh, a sore throat and things like that so I'm here with my chai tea latte um, uh, a glass of ice water and some mint gum and we're going to try to uh, get through this so please just bear with me as we make it through uh, these lectures all right now we're not going to rehash every single thing um, prior to the founding of the nation you should have learned that in eighth and uh, probably 11th grade histories depending on uh, where you went to school, if you went to school in Texas, I'm not sure, I know there's a lot of people here from, uh, other states and places, and so I don't know where you might have gotten that, <clears throat> excuse me, but, uh, I'm not going to rehash an entire course on the, uh, Revolutionary War, but we will sort of hit the high points and sort of, um, give a, a basic background of, um, what took place and how it led to the founding of um, our nation. All right, so let us begin. All right, so <clears throat> we look at some foundational influences. And if we look at the things that influenced the founding of our nation, it's going to kind of be this perfect storm of ideas and things that are going to be taking place. There's going to be an amalgamation of things like British legal and political traditions that are going to be mixed with our own colonial experience. Um, you know, Britain is a very old country, has a, uh, a lot of, of old traditions and uh, a lot of laws and things like that that are really going to affect us because we were colonies of the British. And so we're going to draw upon those as we start creating our own foundation of government. But we're going to mix with it a colonial experience, the, the way that, that we did things in, uh, um, uh, in our experience as colonies of this other nation because we did have a very unique experience. Uh, and we'll talk more about that in just a little while. But then there are some new ideas of governance that had, you know, were relatively recent on the world stage that are really going to help to um, uh, help us to move forward with our government and, and how we, we lay the foundations for uh, the government that still exists today. One of the new ideas on governance is going to be uh, outlined by an individual named Thomas Hobbes. And Thomas Hobbes was a British philosopher in the 17th century. Now, even though we are a democracy um, led you know, by the people, where the power rests with the people, Thomas Hobbes was not a defender of the idea of a democracy. In fact, he <clears throat> was very opposite of this. He liked the idea of a strong authoritarian style of government. And he's going to outline uh, these ideas in a book called Leviathan. And in Leviathan, he is going to write that life without a government um, is a very solitary life. It's very poor. It's nasty. It's brutish. It's short. Because there is no one to maintain control. And he, be he believed that we needed a very authoritarian government that was powerful enough to maintain control and to control civilization, control individuals, um, uh, and, and sort of set set laws 
that are necessary to govern so that life is a little bit better. It's not as nasty and brutish and short. And he believed that the government should be limited uh, on some level. And so he's going to introduce the idea of contract theory, or you might have heard it referred to as the social contract. And in the social contract, people of a certain region are going to voluntarily give up freedom in exchange for an ordered society. And so people want an ordered society. They want laws. They want civilization. But <clears throat> because of human nature, we cannot have this unless we have something in place to order society. And the price of this, the price of having a government in place to order society, is going to be some of our freedoms. We're going to voluntarily give up some of our freedoms in an effort to, uh, or in exchange for, uh, a government in an ordered society. And and Locke, excuse me, Hobbes is going to go on to say that monarchs and governments, they do not get their power from God in the divine right idea that was very prevalent in society during this time period, but instead they derive their power from this contract, the social contract between the individuals, the populace, and the government. And so Thomas Hobbes is going to lay out this idea of the social contract theory. Then John Locke is going to come along. He's also a British philosopher from the 17th century. He is going to expand upon Thomas Hobbes' ideas of a social contract, but he's going to differ a little bit because he does not believe that a monarchy um, is the best way to go. He actually thinks that monarchical power is dangerous. And so he uh, is not going to <clears throat> uh, recommend that a monarchy or a very strong um, um, government with very limited powers is going to be the way in the way that uh, Thomas Hobbes believes. And in fact... Uh, John Locke is going to suggest that people are actually equipped with certain rights at birth, certain things like life, liberty, and property, and that the government's role is to maintain safety of this life and this liberty and this property, okay? But they need to ensure that they not only maintain the safety of the life, but they also do maintain um, protection of these liberties and this property, which was not such a huge deal under Thomas Hobbes' idea. And so John Locke is going to say, if the government does not do so, if the government does not protect this life, liberty, and property, then people have the right and the obligation to overthrow the government and institute a new one. And so he's going to suggest that if one end, if the government end of this bargain, if the, of this contract doesn't uphold, then it's the right of individuals to overthrow that government and to institute a new one. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thomas Jefferson is actually going to borrow very heavily from, from John Locke um, when he writes the Declaration of Independence. Uh, and so these, these ideas should seem a little bit familiar to you uh, if you know anything about the Declaration of Independence. Because uh, Jefferson borrows from Locke, and he's, he, he utilizes these ideas of a limited government and the idea of consent of the governed when utilizing or writing that Declaration of Independence. So it's really going to have a huge impact on some of our foundational documents. And then there's Baron de Montesquieu. And Baron de Montesquieu was a French philosopher in the 17th century, and he argued that um, he argued for the idea of, quote, power being balanced by power. And if we had this idea of power being balanced by power, it would be a safeguard against tyranny. And so Montesquieu is going to develop the idea of separation of powers. Now, <clears throat> I say that he developed these ideas. They were actually already in practice in Britain at the time. Um, because there was a monarchy, which was an executive, and there was a parliament that was a legislature. But Montesquieu is going to develop them more 
and he is actually going to uh, elevate the idea that the judiciary should also be independent. And in Great Britain, the judiciary is controlled by the monarchy. And so he's really going to advocate for this idea of the three branches of government, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial branches, right? And so this also should sound very familiar to you in the American experience. Montesquieu suggests that with these three different branches of government, there are no absolutes. Functions should be separate um, uh, according to the different branches of government, but there would be some overlap, right? And so there is this idea of a separation of powers, but at the same time, the power sort of overlaps with these three branches. However, he's going to develop this idea of the separation of powers. And uh, this is going to be very instrumental in guiding the uh, uh, the American experience as, as we create our own uh, type of government following the Revolutionary War. Now, <coughs> excuse me, we have these... Um, we have these foundational ideas, these, these things that are going to influence our founding documents. It's going to help for us to understand the um, social makeup of the, the American colonies at this time. Um, there are actually some very significant competing interests. There's this idea when we talk about the revolutionary period that all of the colonists were in agreement. They were all fighting for the same thing. They all had common interests. And while that might be true on some minute level, there's actually going to be some significant competing interests that are within the, uh, the American colonies at this time. And there are five sectors of colonial American politics. You've got five different groups vying for power. Uh, you've got the New England merchants, you've got the Southern planters, you've got the royalists. And these are going to be individuals that hold royal lands, titles, or offices. You've got shopkeepers, artisans, and laborers, and you have small farmers, right? And so during the 18th century, we're going to see significant conflict between these different groups. Obviously, New England merchants are going to have differing ideas from southern planters. And southern planters and England, New England merchants, they're going to be kind of the, and the royalists, they're going to be kind of these individuals that are uh, at the top of the socioeconomic spectrum in society. <clears throat> and so they're going to have a differing idea of what is necessary um, than the shopkeepers, the artisans, the laborers, the small farmers will, because these are going to be regular folks. And so they're going to have some really uh, competing interests and conflict over things like taxation and trade and commerce. And by and large, we're going to see a political alliance of New England merchants, southern planters, and royalists. And this is going to allow for a big block of society to keep the more radical ideas in check. And the individuals that really espouse the more radical ideas are going to be these bottom two, the shopkeepers and the small farmers. And so if you have three-fifths of the people uh, together, they're able to outnumber those more radical ideas. Now, after 1760, we're going to start to see some cracks in this, this uh, uh, alliance emerge. The British are going to begin taxing and, and uh, instituting trade policies that begin, begin to split these elite individuals. Radicals will sort of force, will become a force within society to get a toehold and begin to expand their influence. And so this will set in motion a series of events that will lead to that revolutionary war. And so, British taxes versus colonial economic interests. This is going to be a significant driving factor for that Revolutionary War. The British treatment of colonies pre-1750 can really be described, and I think your book puts it this way, as something with benign neglect. Meaning, they didn't really pay that much attention to them as long as the colonies sort of took care of business, paid the money that they were supposed to pay, 
they were sort of left to their own devices. The British crown had a very light-handed approach. They, they, they left the colonies to their own, uh, own devices. There was not much influence in the colonies outside of large cities, and colonists were able to subvert a lot of political control. And overall, they were used to paying very relatively few taxes to Great Britain. And so things sort of worked out for everybody. <clears throat> the colonies were able to sort of, you know, do their own thing, left to their own devices. They were semi-autonomous, and the British didn't really care that much as long as they did pay the few taxes that they were required to pay. But then we have a period between 1756 and 1763 known as the French and Indian War, or sometimes known as the Seven Years' War. And the French and Indian War saw the British uh, protecting the uh, colonies against the encroaching French and native raids. And so we're going to see the French and the Indians team up to sort of encroach upon British land. And so Great Britain, the crown, will protect the colonists. They will provide naval for protection for shipping in and out of the colonies. But it takes a military, excuse me, it takes money to create a military. And so it's not cheap. And Britain was limited in their ability to correct revenues. They could only collect revenues via tariffs and, and, and taxes on commerce. And so they're going to search for a new revenue source. And when they do this, they're going to start instituting new taxes on commerce, which will infuriate the colonies. And so we're going to see them enact things like the Stamp Act. And in the Stamp Act, Stamp Act, any printed paper used in the colonies was subjected to the Stamp Act. In reality, the cost was minimal, right? You had to have a stamp on any printed paper. You had to pay a small tax. And so it was very small, but the colonists didn't like it on principle. This is going to be the first time that taxes are going to be levied on commerce as a way to strictly make money. Typically, when taxes were levied on commerce, it was, to util uh, it was utilized to regulate commerce. And so they sort of see this as a slippery slope. If we start allowing them to tax things in order to strictly make money, when will their appetite be filled? They see this money that they're making in this regard, and we're letting them do it, well, what's to say they won't add another tax to make more money, and another, and another? And so they didn't like the precedence that it set for the future. <clears throat> and so it was not approved by the colonial legislatures. There was a lot of infuriation uh, th uh, that, that, that occurred in the colonies as a result of the Stamp Act. In 1764, the Sugar Act is going to be enacted by the British Crown, and it's going to tax sugar, molasses, and other commodities. Well, this really hurts the New England merchants and the Southern planters the most. And so these two members of this moderate bloc that really kept the radicals in check are going to break away from the royalists, uh, and, and they're going to join the farmers, the shopkeepers, and the artisans. So for the first time, you're going to start to see cracks in that alliance. And while there used to be three-fifths that kept those, those lower-end people sort of in check, those more radical people in check, now we're starting to see a significant majority, four-fifths of, of the population, uh, sort of gang up on, on one-fifth, that royalist group. And so they're going to unite themselves against the tax under the, the banner of, quote, no taxation without representation, which you've probably heard before. And with this new alliance of all of these members, the colonists were able to effectively organize boycotts of British good, goods, and this is going to hurt the crown. And so the crown will rescind the taxes. Now, the elite saw this as a victory, but they supported Britain's moves to restore order in the colonies. So those merchants and those planters, they did what they had to do in order to win the battle, but they were not ready to break away from the British crown. 
they actually wanted the British influence to restore order in the colonies because they had sort of rabble-roused uh, the farmers and the uh, laborers and the artisans, and now these people are sort of keyed up. They're ready to, to fight. And the, 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 the elite groups are like, no, we're not, this is not what we want to do. We just simply want the taxes rescinded, and then we want things to go back to normal. And so they're going to align themselves with these lower groups, these, these, these two uh, smaller groups of people in society, um, only when it's beneficial for them. And when they get what they want, they're going to realign with the British crown. And then in 1770, we're going to see what's known as the Boston Massacre. Now, it's under, important to understand that even with the Boston Massacre, most upper-class Bostonians supported the Crown uh, and the soldiers that were involved in the massacre. Okay? So, all of the colonies are not ready to break away from the Crown yet. We still have a significant group of the upper crust who are... Uh, are, are on the side of the crown. And they say that because the radicals in society had been energized by their brief alliance with the elite, they mobilized the, these, um, these radicals in society are going to mobilize themselves to create resistance to the British. And so the British are going to, the British soldiers are going to fire into an angry mob in Boston. Five individuals will be killed. Um, by and large, the upper crust within society are not going to blame the crown for this. And in fact, the soldiers involved are going to be defended by none other than John Adams, who was the future, you know, will be the future president and a pillar in Bostonian society. And he will assure the acquittal of six of the eight soldiers, right? <clears throat> But this is just sort of adding more fuel to the fire for these radicals. Now, we're going to start to see the colonists become more radicalized. And it's going to be not necessarily uh, the result of taxes per se, but it's going to have to do significantly with this uh, idea of economic um, uh, meddling, British meddling in the economics of, of the American colonies. And so we have what's called the East India Company, the East India Tea Company, and they're struggling. And so the British government grants a politically powerful East India Company a monopoly on the export of tea from Britain. What this does is it eliminates a money-making form of trade for colonial merchants. East India Company is going to bypass colonial merchants and sell tea directly to the public in the colonies. And so the merchants are going to be cut out as the middlemen, essentially. These merchants used to go buy tea from Britain and then sell it in the colonies and make money. Well, now Britain is selling tea uh, to the colonies very directly. And so this is going to create some extreme economic threats to colonial merchants. So once again, these moderating influences in government, these merchants, these planters, they're going to join forces with these radical groups. And merchants and planters still don't intend to break away from Britain, but they want a resolution to the economic strife. But the more uh, radical groups do hope to create a situation where the British are provoked and the elites become irreconcilably angry. So these radical groups realize we've got to do something to provoke Britain. Because if we do something to provoke Britain and Britain acts on that, then they will go too far and they will piss off these elite individuals within society uh, to a point that these elites are not going to want to go back. And they're going to want to move forward with breaking away from uh, the British crown. And so we have the Boston Tea Party of 1773. Samuel Adams is going to lead a group of individuals. They will board three ships that are moored in Boston Harbor, and they will throw 342 chests of tea into the harbor. 
Okay, so we have to ask ourselves, what are they trying to accomplish? Well, they're trying to provoke the British. They're trying to provoke the British to take action. And so when, excuse me, when this occurs, uh, the British government will enact uh, a series of reprisals. They will react to uh, this Boston Tea Party. They close the Boston Harbor. They eliminate any element of self-government in Boston. They dissolve the legislature. They remove the accused. <coughs> Excuse me. They removed those who are accused in the colonies to stand trial in Britain. Well, why is that a big deal? Well, because they're not going to be getting... If you stand trial in a country thousands of miles from your home, thousands of miles from your peers, it's not going to be necessarily a fair trial. They restrict movement beyond the Appalachian Mountains, which really infuriates the planters who want to develop this region. And so this Boston Tea Party will really uh, create a situation where Britain reacts in such a way that it becomes almost irreconcilable. They accomplish this goal of radicalizing colonists. Colonists are going to convene for the First Continental Congress. They're going to call for a complete boycott of British goods. They begin, for the first time, to explore the possibility of independence. And eventually, this will lead to the writing of the Declaration of Independence. And so, this leads us to this foundational document that's very important within uh, American society, the Declaration of Independence. In 1776, the Second Continental Congress will convene, and a committee will convene to draft a statement of American independence. This committee will be comprised of Thomas Jefferson of Virginia, Benjamin Franklin of Pennsylvania, Roger Sherman of Connecticut, John Adams of Massachusetts, and Robert Livingston of New York. And the philosophy, there's a couple of different things we have to look at with the Declaration of Independence. First of all, we have to look at the philosophy, and second of all, we have to look at the politics. The philosophy behind the Declaration of Independence is, is remarkable because it asserts that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness cannot be curtailed. And essentially, this is what the British crown was doing to the people, curtailing their life, their freedoms, and their ability to pursue happiness. Obviously, it's going to be heavily influenced by the works of John Locke. Remember, John Locke had asserted that all individuals were equal and possessed a natural right to defend their lives, liberties, and possessions. That's what the colonists feel like they are doing. They do not feel like they are in rebellion. They feel like they are fighting against uh, tyranny, um, the crown, who is essentially, excuse me, <clears throat> who is essentially uh, um, impeding upon their lives, their liberties, and their possessions. And so individuals are going to create a government to protect these rights. Okay, but that had a duty and a responsibility to alter or abolish it as necessary. Remember, these are ideas of John Locke. And so that's what the colonists are feeling like they are trying to exercise in the writing of this declaration. The politics behind the declaration, remember that uh, politics plays a huge role. And the declaration is remarkable in this regard because it focuses on grievances, aspirations, and principles that might unify the various colonial groups that were otherwise divided economically, philosophically, and geographically. So they're essentially creating a document that can unite all of these different groups, no matter their socioeconomic background, their geographic location, or their wants or their needs. It's uniting them all together behind a common cause. It was meant to forge national unity, and it was an explanation to the rest of the world why American colonists were attempting to break away from Great Britain. And so it's going to be very remarkable in that there are a number of aims that it tries 
to to meet but at the same time it's creating national unity and it's demonstrating why america is trying to break away from their mother country all right we'll stop here and when we come back we're going to talk about the american uh first national government and uh, that will take us through, uh, we'll talk about the Articles of Confederation, and that will take us through the ratification of the Constitution. All right, so I'll see you in the next lecture.